Good morning and welcome. It's uh, great to see you this morning. There's one or two people just uh, arriving, so I'll go slowly as we start. Um, for those of you that go into the, the vestry, you'll notice there's four guitars. If anybody wants to play along, uh, we got these for Lighthouse Family Church, which we're normally doing on a Thursday. Um, though we are having to ration them quite carefully because uh, the kids do get rather, rather um, protective over them. Uh, and also use them as weapons. Um, so, uh, but, but, but it's good to have some fun. But do pray for Lighthouse Family Church. Though this week, if you know anybody um, of the right age or any families that would come, or grandparents, grandparents, uh, grandkids, um, we're going to move it to Wednesday because I have uh, appointments on Thursday that just mean I can't, I can't do both. And so, uh, just a slight difference this week. If anybody wants to play with an air guitar today, you can do. Just going to go and shut that door to the heater um, because it does it'll bring less noise in. Can you hear the difference? And so hopefully that will help. Um, I had hoped in particular for this morning for the first song, because it's not uh, ideal on this instrument, uh, that Margaret Toft would be able to play with, with us this morning, but uh, she isn't. So therefore, uh, I will sing the first verse with you, but after that, I will law the tune, or hum the tune, and leave you to pick up the words yourselves um, just the way that the music that we have is laid out um, just to make it of the earth, for the beauty of the skies, for the love which from our birth, over and around us lies, Father unto thee we raise, this our sacrifice of praise. For the beauty of each hour, la 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 Please sit. And we're thinking in particular today about bringing our sacrifice of praise and thanksgiving to God in response to his generosity to us, shown in creation and shown in the gift of Jesus to die for us. 
and shown every day as the Spirit moves near us. And so we're reminded in great joy that this is the day that the Lord has made. Let us rejoice and be glad in it. We say together, we have come together in the name of Christ to offer our praise and thanksgiving, to hear and receive God's holy word, to pray for the needs of the world and to seek forgiveness of our sins, that by the power of the Holy Spirit, we may give ourselves to the service of God. Jesus says, repent for the kingdom of heaven is close at hand. So let us turn away from our sins and turn to Christ, confessing our sins in penitence and faith. Lord God, we have sinned against you. We've done evil in your sight. We are sorry and repent. Have mercy on us according to your love. Wash away our wrongdoing and cleanse us from all our sin. Renew a right spirit within us and restore us to the joy of your salvation through Jesus Christ our Lord. Amen. May the Father of all mercies cleanse us from our sins, restore us in his image to the praise and glory of his name. Amen. But you never really noticed that in the confession and in the absolution, the last two bits that we said together and that I said, uh, thanksgiving and praise is part of it. But it, the part of our confession is that we want God to restore us to the joy of our salvation. And we finish the absolution with that we may, uh, to the praise and glory of his name, as we're invited uh, to live in the joy of what God has done and is doing in creation, in salvation, and in our lives in transformation and sanctification, to throw a number of big words at you if you want to get excited about them. And we show some of our thanksgiving for God by the way in which we serve him in the world, and uh, we've done that in, in Harvest with bringing produce to church to celebrate all God's bounty to us in Harvest. When you go back into the Old Testament and the teachings about harvest and tithes, God sort of says, there you go, I give you all of that, and just give me a tenth of it. It's from my gift to you. You get to keep 90%. And that was really part of the sort of story of the tithe that God generously gives to us, and God generously uh, encourages us to join in his world. And so Oasis has sent a letter, I was trying to look around for it, it seems to have disappeared from the front here, to thank us uh, for the harvest produce that we've sent to Oasis. It makes so, many diff so much difference to so many people, and uh, it's, it's uh, sort of, they are just overjoyed uh, with the way in which we and the schools uh, have, have just poured out love to them in the gifts that we've sent to them. Also, thank you to all those who got involved in, in organising the coffee morning yesterday as we we're trying to get things back going. Got the toddler group going at St Mary's down at the community centre on Tuesday um, as we we're trying to get everything going and offer those. Um, but there's plenty and plenty of areas uh, in which people can volunteer in church life and can give uh, in their own generosity to God. But as we think about that, as we move on through this, to the service, we're, we're going to start off um, with our first of our readings from Scripture, which comes from Colossians. The first reading is from Colossians, verses 12 through 17. Therefore, as God's chosen people, holy and dearly loved, clothe yourselves with compassion, kindness, humility, gentleness, and patience. Bear with each other and forgive one another if any of you has a grievance against someone. Forgive as the Lord forgave you. And over all these virtues, put on love, which binds them all together in perfect unity. Let the peace of Christ rule in your hearts, since as members of one body, you were called to peace. 
and be thankful. Let the message of your Christ dwell among you richly as you teach and admonish one another with all wisdom through psalms, hymns, and songs from the Spirit, singing to God with gratitude in your hearts. And whatever you do, whether in word or deed, do it all in the name of the Lord Jesus, giving thanks to God the Father through him. This is the word of the Lord. I don't know how you've gone on this week so far in listening to the um, gratitude uh, podcasts that the Church of England have put on. I uh, hope you've listened to at least some of them and been caught up with how generosity uh, has sort of uh, caught in various churches in various ways and that's made a difference uh, and uh, the Church of England is just celebrating the rich variety of the ways in which we can do that. One of the ways we've done that here during lockdown, obviously, uh, was also by supporting Wellspring uh, through Yvonne's work. And we were hoping to have a testimony from somebody who had been homeless and here in Disley and Yvonne had been working with. We haven't got that today, um, but it was going to be picking up that sense of gratitude for the way in which our love pouring out through Wellspring and more directly uh, through Yvonne. Uh, makes an impact in somebody else's spiritual journey and somebody's life, the physical life uh, that they're living. And hopefully, uh, Stuart will come at some point in the future and will share with us some of his story. But uh, do just hold on to some of those uh, testimonies and witnesses that we've had this week through those podcasts. If you've not listened to them, you can find the link on our Facebook page. If you, our Facebook page is Disley Parish Churches. And that link is going to be good, basically, I think, forever. The Church of England is leaving it up as a resource online. And so you will be able to go and listen, perhaps, just to one a week over the coming weeks. But there's some great stories of ways in which the Church has responded to the love of God to us by being generous out to others. And uh, very different churches, churches in inner-city areas, churches in rural areas, um, churches that were big and churches that were small, Uh, all finding ways to reach out and to bless others um, with generosity and how that unlocks so much of what we do in the church. And uh, as we continue thinking of Thanksgiving, we have our reading from the Gospel. The second reading is taken from Luke chapter 17, verses 11 to 19. Jesus heals ten men with leprosy. Now on his way to Jerusalem, Jesus travelled along the border between Samaria and Galilee. As he was going into a village, ten men who had leprosy met him. They stood at a distance and called out in a loud voice, Jesus, Master, have pity on us. When he saw them, he said, go, show yourselves to the priests. And as they went, they were cleansed. One of them, when he saw he was healed, came back, praising God in a loud voice. He threw himself at Jesus' feet and thanked him. And he was a Samaritan. Jesus asked, were not all 10 cleansed? Where are the other nine? Has no one returned to give praise to God except this foreigner? Then he said to him, rise and go, your faith has made you well. This is the word of the Lord. And it's great to have Graham sharing with us again what God has laid on his heart. I've already heard it once and I'm looking forward to hearing it a second time. Let's pray as Graham comes up. Father God, we thank you for Graham. And pray that the words you've been stirring in his hearts, your spirit will stir in our hearts too. Amen. Good morning. It's good to be in the house of the Lord, isn't it? It's always good to be in God's house. You might be tired, weary, 
thinking, oh, it's Graham, here for two hours. You want today? It's a short one today. Let's pray. God and Father, we praise your wonderful name. We thank you that you are the God of your house and we are your servants. We come to worship and we come to praise your name. And I pray, Heavenly Father, as we open your precious word, that you may just pour it into our hearts, that it may refresh us, ignite a passion for you and a love for each other that we've never had before and a desire to serve you more and know you more in your precious name. Amen. So I'm looking at Colossians chapter 3, verses 12 to 17. I've got six verses today. It's a nice change from two chapters, or big, thick chapters. I want a, I want a short one. And in verses 1 to 4, the Apostle Paul emphasizes their spiritual identity being in Jesus Christ as their saviour. So the identity of us is found as a Christian in Jesus and him alone. And he encourages them to do some important things. First, to seek the things that are above to set our minds on the things that are above and not on the things of earth, so to put heavenly things in a more important position than earthly things. He tells them that they are hidden in Christ as their saviour, and I find that a great encouragement as a Christian, that I'm hidden in Jesus, not because of what I've done for him, but because of his amazing love for me, and he hides me in himself and protects me. And also he says our identity is in him, And one day we will be revealed with him in glory. So the Apostle Paul looks to the bigger picture always, not just to what we are now, but to what we're going to be in the future. So as now we're Christians hidden in Christ, in his church, in his ministry, but he's saying, but you're looking ahead to that great day when you're going to be with Jesus in glory. And that's the end game that he always draws us to in his ministry and in his teaching. So it's not a bad starting point, is it? who we are, what we are, where we're going to go, and it's not because of what we've done. It's all because of his grace, his love, and his mercy towards us. But from verses 5 through to 11, which we're not dealing with this morning, Paul wants us to put off the old life, the old nature, the things which pull us down, the sinful nature, the things we do wrong. And that's unique to each one of us, the things which catch us out. And Paul says, no, you put these things off, and focus on what you need to focus on. And he wants us to re- remind us that the old life that we used to have is gone. Those old wrong desires have gone, or should have gone, and we should have new desires for him. So the old character is changing and maturing and being sanctified, that big word that Stuart used this morning, into a new creation in Christ. So what we looked like before in sin now changes to what we are becoming in Christ. And that is a change of spiritual character, which also changes our natural nature in our service for him. So in today's passage, verses 12 to 17, we see the picture of our identity as a Christian, what it looks like and what it is in our daily life. The identity. We're identified as the chosen or the elect and the beloved. What a beautiful statement. Do you feel chosen and elect beloved of God this morning? Do you realise how precious you are in God's sight? You are chosen of him. You are born again of the spirit of Christ. You are so special. You are unique in his presence this morning. In real terms, the chosen and the elect are those who have responded to the gospel and accepted Jesus as their personal saviour. And you cannot be chosen or elect if you don't know him. So if you just come to church, that doesn't make you part of Christ's kingdom. You have to know Jesus as your personal saviour. And then the Apostle Paul goes into some very important Christian characteristics. And I put it under the title of personal development because this is what he tells us to do. And it's all very, very personal. He says, clothe yourselves or put on, is how he starts it, with compassion, kindness, humility, meekness and patience. Five wonderful things characters and he tells us to clothe ourselves with those they are not given to us by God we're told to clothe ourselves with these he tells us also in the next verse to bear with one another as we are forgiven by God so we must also forgive each other so these qualities now roll into we must be a forgiving people one for another which I think is a little bit harder he then goes on to say you must clothe yourselves or put on love 
which binds everything together. And it's a bit like a cake mix. You stick the egg in the middle, I believe. I've only ever made one cake in my life. But you stick the egg in and it binds it all together. It's the love which binds us all together in unity and peace, one with another. And that's what we should look like. So Paul's saying, these are the six important characteristics that I want you to have. Compassion, humility, kindness, meekness, patience, and loving. Love. And the love brings us together in unity and harmony. Ephesians 6 says, and it's again something we've got to do, it says, put on the whole armour of God to help us in our Christian walk. So this is not just a unique passage for Paul. He emphasises it continually through the epistles that we have to work out our salvation and work in these qualities. But did you notice, he says, clothe yourselves or put on the term twice in verses 12 and 14. It's not done for, for us. We have to choose to have compassion. We have to choose to have kindness. We have to choose to be humble, meek, patient and loving. So the first question is, how did you fare in the six qualities that Paul says this morning? Well, I, I checked myself out on this. I thought, I should be all right with these ones. So I looked at the thought, compassionate, not bad in compassion. All right on that one, not bad on that one. Kindness, not bad in kindness. Humility, not, not my strongest point. I think I'm humble, but meekness, not my strongest point. Patience, absolutely not. No, not got that one, really. But love, yes. I do love God and I love the church. I love people. It's a, it's a, very, it's a gift that I believe God works within myself, but in all of us. So how do you fare in those qualities? What are your strengths? Score 10. What are your weaknesses? Things to work at. And we have to work at these things, is what Paul is saying this morning. And it forms our spiritual character in him, which translates into something much greater as we work through this passage as a representation of the church. And if you've been a Christian for, for five years or more, I would suggest we should be good at most of these characteristics. They should be bedrock of our Christian life and our walk with him. And we'll see why it's so important shortly. Verse 13 says we must bear with one another and we must forgive one another. The example being as we are forgiven as Christ loves us. So how are you faring with that one? We're like a forgiveness this morning. Good one that in church, isn't it? Someone steps on your toes, puts your nose out of joint and we, and we just don't talk to them again, do we? We get people on our side and we don't forgive really. We never move on. Um, sorry, you can't allow to do that. We have to forgive and put things right because it affects our relationship with us. First John says, if we don't forgive each other, it says the love of God isn't in us. A bit strong, but that's the way it is. We have to forgive. So we have to bear with each other. And that means your unique quirks and my unique quirks. We're all different and it makes up the body. If you read Romans chapter 12, it goes into this in great detail of all the body coming together as one. And then it says, and then we're together personally. It takes two distinct parts of it, but it wants us to be one as a body united in Christ. And that's the quirkiness of all our characteristics, which makes the wonderful body of Christ. So we have to learn to tolerate each other. And if you look at the scripture, there's plenty of examples where Mark, the Apostle Paul couldn't tolerate Mark because he just was, couldn't work with him. So Barnabas takes him away with him, sorts him out. Years later, Paul and Mark get reunited and Paul says he's, he's a good servant. Sometimes you've got to just move away and let things develop, haven't you? But we have to bear with each other and our quirks and our faults. Because sometimes we have the nature of our actions. I know this doesn't apply to anybody in this church here where you're arrogant, stubborn, stupid, no grace. I know none of you are like that. You're all full of all the qualities. Reality is we're not, are we? We sometimes let the wrong characteristics that overshadow the, the, the right characteristics. And that affects a couple of things. Our relationship with one another, which is paramount in the church, and also our worship with God. Because when you're looking at someone with unforgiveness in your heart, how can you worship the living God with all your heart, soul, mind and strength? So it does affect our worship. It goes deeper than that. It affects our ministry as a church. It affects our reach into the community. People come to your church with division and bitterness, backbiting and whinging and complaining, which I know never happens in churches. But when it does, it reflects the church. 
And it affects people who come through the doors. So verse 14 says, Above all, clothe yourselves. or put on love which binds everything together. So the love of Christ must shine through us. But we must work at our relationships with one another within the church. We're bound together in love. You know the scripture, Galatians 5, 22 and 23. The fruits of the Spirit are love, joy, peace, patience, kindness, goodness, meekness, gentleness and self-control. Against such thing there is no law. They're the qualities. They're the fruits of the Spirit. And the fruits of the Spirit are at work in us continually as Christians. That we're filled with the Spirit. We're born of the Spirit. And the work of the Holy Spirit is there within us. And God encourages us, or the Apostle Paul encourages us, to wrap ourselves, our clothes, ourselves in love. And have all these qualities evident within us in our Christian walk and in our day-to-day walk in our lives. You're familiar with Corinthians 1 verse 13. Love is patient. Love is kind. It does not envy. It does not boast. It is not proud. It is not rude. It is not self-seeking. It's not easily angered. Note it keeps no record of wrongs. Love does not delight in evil, but rejoices with the truth. See how important love is. And we're told to clothe ourselves in love. And when we do, these are the qualities that overflow or should overflow from within us. It binds us together in harmony and unity. And I want to encourage us all to consider these things this morning. You see, the most generous act a Christian can do is to love one another, no matter what. Jesus said, love the Lord your God with all your heart, soul, mind and strength. Love your neighbour as yourself. All the law and the prophets hang on these two commands. It's a command to love each other. And greater love has no man than this, that he lays down his life for a friend. The importance of love cannot be underestimated. The importance of the spiritual qualities that come from that should never be underestimated. So we see the text come come together in verse 15 with a couple of additional encouragements from Paul. Paul tells us to let the peace of Christ rule within our hearts, to which you were called in the one body, and be thankful and let the word of Christ dwell in us richly. Romans 12.5 says, So we who are many are one body in Christ, and individually we are members of one another. We're joined together and we're corporate. And this is what the gospel calls us to do. And this is what the Christian walk calls us to be. We should look like something as a Christian. Because our identity and our nature and our Christian virtues are shaped by the Lord and by his word. So do we let Christ dwell in us? Do we have the peace of God in our hearts. So this morning as you've gathered here together, are you at peace with God this morning as you've walked into church? Are we at peace with one another? Is God's word dwelling richly within us? What's feeding us? What's guiding us? What is directing us? The peace of Christ comes through a living relationship with him where he is at the forefront of our lives and his word is in our heart which underpins our faith and guides us in everything we do in his name. You ought to remember, we're called to dwell in him because we are his servants. He's our master. That's the great calling. But we get the great reward of eternity with him. As the Bible dwells on us richly, it says we can teach and admonish one another. It's an it's outgoing work where it becomes something that's relevant to each of us in our service of God. Encouraging, teaching, building each other up. It says... We have gratitude in our hearts. We, we sing hymns. We sing psalms and spiritual songs. How often do you do that to each other? I think I'm spiritual songs like modern choruses. You never know. Can't, it's a bit controversial. It leads us into worshipping God because it's an overflowing from the heart. So whatever's within us is what's going to come out of us. So Christ, Christ's richness and his word dwells within us. It's a thing that's going to overflow and it's going to encourage others. We were with some friends yesterday for a lovely walk. And we talked about the things we've got an awful lot on the walks. I've not seen this couple for ages. And it was just the loveliest day. And I felt really encouraged by what they were telling me in the ministry they're involved in. It was just so encouraging. And I went home thinking that was just a great day. Lovely day out, tea and coffee, cake, lots of exercise but to be encouraged by people who are serving the living God. You see, the word of God takes us to a place that whatever we do in word or deed, 
We do in the name of the Lord Jesus, giving thanks to God through him. Jesus should be at the forefront of everything we do because we're representing him in our lives. So the natural progression is that once we were far from God, when we embrace these spiritual qualities, we come close to God, walking with Jesus, obeying his word, and it leads us into an attitude of thanksgiving, praise, and worship of his name. And that just doesn't happen in church. That's an overflow of our life. So we wake up with this. We go to bed with it, and everything in between is born of, of the way we live our lives in him. So when we come to church, are you, have you come to worship this morning? Have you come to praise God? What's our heart like this morning? Because Jesus' heart is to receive our worship, receive our praise, to receive our prayers. From the start of this passage, we see the Apostle Paul showing us who we are. Your identity is in Christ. He shows us what to do. He shows us how to do it. And all the benefits for us are relationships with one another and ultimately, through his word, culminating in our worship of God Not out of duty, but out of love. There's nothing better when you do something out of love, isn't there? Because it means so much more. Jesus is described as the indescribable gift whom God sent to us, to all who believe. We are recipients of that gift this morning, those of you who know Jesus as your saviour. It's the most generous act of a living God who gave his son as a sacrifice for our sins. That's what God did for us. That act of ultimate generosity, giving Jesus to die for our sin. So as we clothe ourselves in him, we should be adopting the same generosity he has for us. Pouring out his life on the cross for us, loving us, guiding us, and preparing a place in heaven for all time. He now wants us to do the same. Drink of the love of God and generously pour it out in our lives, into our families, into our workplace, into our community, into our church. And we'll have an impact. And once we allow that generosity to flow, forgiveness is easy. Grudges don't last. Hurt can be lifted. Peace, harmony and unity will abide in the church. Where we consider the most important things for the greater good for the Lord's work rather than what's more important to us. And that's the, that's the, the, the sacrificial change where we see other things, things more important than what we want. The act of generosity means, of the heart means, we will bear with one another. As hard as that might seem, and sometimes it is hard to bear with each other because we just grind each other, don't we? But Christian generosity is selfless, utterly selfless. It's without impure motive or desire. It puts others before ourselves, expecting nothing in return. Why is that? Because it glorifies the name of God. That's what it's all about. We're going to receive our inheritance. But until we do, let's glorify God in all that we do. So what sort of church do we desire to be? One controlled by our desires and ways, and or shaped in accordance with Colossians chapter 3, Verses 12 to 17. And verse 17 says, Whatever you do in word or deed, do everything in the name of the Lord Jesus, giving thanks to God the Father through him. And it's having godly virtues and character. That's what God is shaping us to be like his son. If we're not happy in our church, our faith, our services, our expectation, we're not happy with each other, if we're not happy with the music, the worship, the ministry, or even your vicar, Stuart, may I suggest a change of clothes? Put on compassion, kindness, humility, meekness, kindness, and love to completely refresh our faith. Because that's the thing which does refresh our faith, heavenly virtues. You see, our church here isn't cold and lifeless. It's a living organism with Christ at the centre, gloriously pouring out his spirit, his grace and his mercy on us all, continually. It's marvellous being a Christian because there's so much going on in the heavenlies that we never see, but he's still pouring it out on us to glorify his name through us. If we want to see a move of God in our church, then the key is to remain in him and worship him. Chapter 1, verse 23, it says to be steadfast. Chapter 2, verse 7 says to be rooted 
Chapter 3 verse 14 says to clothe ourselves or put on love. And chapter 4 verse 1 says be devoted to prayer. And as we move in these areas, as we seek the living God, as we worship the living God, that generosity that he pours into our hearts, we will pour out liberally into the hearts and lives of others. He will generously pour out his blessing on his church, his people, for the glory of his name and for our salvation. May God bless his precious words this morning. Amen. Thanks, sir. So are you ready to Eucharist? In that word, with thanks, to give thanks, the word is actually Eucharist in the Greek. It's uh, what we're supposed to do every time we come to communion. We're supposed to be pouring out our thanks to God. But also in there, it just says, in our words and deeds, we Eucharist God. Uh, we Eucharist to God for all that Jesus has done. And from our thankfulness it all flows and this is sort of uh, exactly the same sort of mechanism that happens sort of say for me uh, I, I was so thankful that uh, my father-in-law and my mother-in-law uh, both gave their daughter to me and so I'd have done anything for them out of thanksgiving and that's how uh, we respond to God with what we do um, Graham and Tracy, when they first came to me as I was thinking of settling here in the church, asked me a question about um, what do you do about giving in this church? What do you teach about giving? And I said, well, it should be um, significant and it should be generous and it should be sort of thank done thankfully with a smile on your face, with gratitude. Um, and it picks up this very teaching that it actually flows from where we are with God and our relationship with God is. And so the question, just to pause as we respond to what Graham has said, is to open ourselves and let the Holy Spirit shine in. And where is he putting his spotlight today? For me, it's probably on the area of peace. I do tend to lie awake at night and for hours worry about how do we share Christ with the 8,000 people that live around us? How do we become viable uh, a community sharing Christ with others? And the invitation is to go deeper into God's love. Find that love drives out fear. Love reflects in our lives and gives us new clothes. And so as you breathe in, let the Spirit breathe into you. As you breathe out, Let go of those things you need to let go of. And let God come in more. And let go of other things. Just like Christian in Pilgrim's Progress, let his burdens fall into the valley. God fill you with love and joy and peace. And know the joy of that. That from God's generosity comes our generosity. And our generosity is done as a response of thanksgiving to God. From God's love comes our love. 
from God's peace comes our peace. And let the Spirit work in you. I know it doesn't flow from you, but it flows from God to you. And like unblocking a drain, we let it flow from us to those around us. Come Holy Spirit. And with it all being about God in us, let us say some of what we believe about God using the form of the creed on the screen. We believe in God the Father, from whom every family in heaven and on earth is named. We believe in God the Son, who lives in our hearts through faith and fills us with his love. We believe in God the Holy Spirit, who strengthens us with power from on high. We believe in one God, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. Amen. As our Saviour taught us, so we pray. Our Father in heaven, hallowed be your name. Your kingdom come, your will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us today our daily bread. Forgive us our sins, as we forgive those who sin against us. Lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For the kingdom, the power, and the glory are yours, now and forever. Amen. As we think that it comes from God to us and works out through us, through his Holy Spirit's work in us, um, just think, just pick up how this picks up that flow in the collect for today. <clears throat> God, the giver of life, whose spirit wells up within your church, by the Spirit's gifts, equip us to live the gospel of Christ and make us eager to do your will, that we may share with the whole creation the joys of eternal life through Jesus Christ, your Son, our Lord, who is alive and reigns with you in the unity of the Holy Spirit, one God, now and forever. Amen. And I love that the Spirit's job there in one of those old prayers of the church is to well up in us and make us eager to do his will. Um, in, and to share the joys of eternal life as we are called to Eucharist, to give thanks to God in our words and our deeds, which is what Paul says. And perhaps to some extent, we're not worthy to come for the Eucharist until we come Eucharist in our words and deeds. Um, there's, a, there's a teaser thought for you as we say together the morning collect. Almighty and everlasting Father, we thank you that you have brought us safely to the beginning of this day. Keep us from falling into sin or running into danger. Order us in all our doings and guide us to do always what is right in your eyes through Jesus Christ our Lord. Amen. So thinking of God's will in the world, we come to our prayers of intercession.
In the power of the Spirit and in union with Christ, let us pray. In response to the words, hear us, Lord, please answer, Lord, graciously hear us. Lord, hear us. Lord, graciously hear us. We pray for your church throughout the world and all who work to lead and teach us in your ways. We give thanks for those who have recently been appointed to General Synod and pray that you bless them and support them as they take on this important role. Here in Disley, we give thanks for our vicar Stuart, our readers and pastoral workers, and the many people who step forward in important roles within our churches. Give us all the courage and willingness to be your witnesses in ways that are generous and respectful and which come from the knowledge of your love for us. Lord, hear us. Lord, graciously hear us. Lord, our world faces many challenges and we know that in many ways we have failed to care for your creation. We pray for the COP26 conference starting next weekend and trust that the UK will be ambitious when setting goals for the future. We ask that nations build trust as they come together to tackle the global climate crisis. May decisions be made for the benefit of all people, especially those who have contributed least to the climate crisis, yet live in the front line facing its disastrous impacts. May the wealthier, influential nations make decisions which will benefit, not hinder, countries that are struggling with debt. And we hope that this conference will create a positive impact for the future of every nation. Lord, hear us. Lord, graciously hear us. This world is made up of many nations with different customs and beliefs, and we can sometimes struggle to find common ground. We pray for all those who put themselves forward to lead and guide in this diverse environment. This week, we have once again seen how fragile human life can be and the dangers which such people can face. Gracious God, we are thankful for all those who give their lives to public service and we are deeply saddened when it comes at such a great cost. Be with all who love the late David Amos and especially with his family at this difficult time. We pray for all those affected by this violent act and may your comforting love and healing grace be with them all. Lord, hear us. Lord, graciously hear us. Today, many people are facing their own personal challenges in mind, body and spirit. We know you are both a healer and our Lord and a healer of your broken world. And we ask you to touch all those who are on our hearts today. Be with them through the support of families and friends and the care of doctors, nurses, and help them to know that you are always there. Lord, hear us. Lord, graciously hear us. We thank you for all the people who have shaped our lives but we see no longer. Help us to remember them well and trust that they are at peace with you. Comfort all who are sad today. And in a moment of quiet, we bring to mind those known personally to us. Lord, hear us. Lord, graciously hear us. Heavenly Father, we thank you that you are always more than ready to hear our prayers and respond to them, often in ways that are beyond our expectations or imagination. Help us to recognise those in need and play our part in your response. Merciful Father, accept these prayers for the sake of your Son, our Saviour, Jesus Christ. Amen.
So from our intimacy with God from, and from what God has done to us, we respond in words and deeds in the name of Jesus Christ and we Eucharist God, we give thanks to God in those words and deeds. And we're going to start off by giving thanks uh, in word and then I invite you to find at least one way this week to give thanks in deeds as we thank God for the outpouring of what God has done to us in Jesus. His love endures forever, for he is good, he is above all things. His love endures forever, sing praise, sing praise. With a mighty hand and an outstretched arm, his love endures forever. For the life that's been reborn, His love endures forever. Sing praise, sing praise, sing praise, sing praise. Forever God is faithful, forever God is strong. Forever God is with us, forever, forever. From the rising to the setting sun, His love endures forever. By the grace of God, we will carry on. His love endures forever, sing praise. Sing praise, sing praise, sing praise. Forever God is faithful, forever God is strong, forever God is with us, forever, forever. God is faithful, forever God is strong, forever God is with us, forever, forever. And Lord, we want to make our Eucharist to you, our thanksgiving to you for what you've done in Jesus, for what you do in your creation and in every harvest. And pray that through your generosity to us, your spirit will so set us alight that we will pour out in word and deed to others. In the name of Jesus. Amen. The peace of God which passes all understanding. Keep your hearts and minds in the knowledge and love of God and of his Son, Jesus Christ our Lord. And the blessing of God Almighty, the Father, the Son and the Holy Spirit be with you and remain with you always. Amen. Amen. So go in peace to love and serve the Lord in the name of Christ. Amen. And do it with a smile on your face in thanksgiving.